Yo, what's good, y'all? Welcome to another episode of Fun With Dumb. I know for the last couple of months, I've been having my regular co-hosts, and we kind of broke format of how we usually conduct our podcast because of, obviously, the quarantine and the pandemic. A lot of guests didn't want to come come to the studio. Um, and just recently, I'm trying to get back into the groove of actually having um, just different types of guests, like the way we used to have in the first couple episodes and stuff. So... Uh, this is a homie right here that I met a couple weeks back, uh, brand new, didn't know about him or nothing. We had dinner through a mutual friend, and there was like so much common ground through uh, the, the Los Angeles upbringing that we had. And it was just nostalgic for me to kind of <laughs> run into him because it's like the type of homies that I grew up, you know, like it, 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 when I went to school in Los Angeles, like all my teenage years as a skateboarder, a little punk hip hop kid and shit, <laughs> you know, and the Latino community, all that uh he's a writer he was a former writer for the new york times he's an author of a brand new book he just dropped this is the homie walter thompson hernandez how you doing sir what's up man what's going on bro? i'm Thanks good bro i dap you up right now you know bro. I, I know but it's like quarantine and shit <laughs> i know i know i know bro um <laughs> let me just uh like t talk to the people about like uh you know when we met and we just talking about la shit yeah uh, pretty much that's the best explanation um uh, like, how did you how did you just kind of get into writing focused, like focused on a lot of L.A. topics? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, um, I just feel like, you know, it's very few of us. Right. Like from L.A. who are here doing like, you know, creative work. I feel like, you know, you can speak to this, too. Right. Like in most meetings you're, you're in probably throughout the day, like myself included, you know, I'll be in these like type of meetings and I'm usually like the only dude who's from L.A. Right. Like it's always like three cats from like Ohio, like two people from Minnesota, right, some right. New Yorkers. And, and, and so I'm like, man, I feel like if you're from LA, like we really sort of have to like preserve our stories. Cause like, if we don't tell them, somebody else is gonna tell them easy, right. you know, in, in, in like a really quick way. You know, transplants always do that here. But I feel like for me, like all this kind of started, you know, about six, seven years ago when I just started like, you know, pitching different like, you know, media companies. And like, I was in grad school thinking I, I was gonna go like the academic route. I was in like a master's program. PhD program at UCLA and then I was like you know that's not it but I also just want to tell LA stories around the world essentially you know and and so I got hired by the um by the New York Times and started traveling a lot man and yeah kind of like here we are you know was that was that like a like a dream getting hired by the <laughs> New York Times because it's such a huge yeah. media company you know you, you know to be honest like I don't even know if if I dreamed of that growing up, but it, it kind of just happened. That's true. It's not like we're in L.A. So right, like right. New York Times <laughs> New York one Times, day. Right, yeah. no, like, I, I, I don't know if that was the energy, but like I was so excited. Like when I got hired, to be honest with you, man, like I feel like like I cried like, yeah. on the phone. I remember yeah. distinctly because I was at my aunt's house. And like, you know, it's like one of those experiences where like you just know that after this call, things are going to change for you. Right. And right. they did. Right. Like, you know, so I, I remember I, I was at my aunt's house and like six interviews later when like they offered me the job. Like, I, I just started crying on the phone because I was like, you know, it, things going to change for, like, me and my family, and, and they have. And I think a lot of that is their their interest in how connected you were to the real L.A., yeah, right? Yeah. I feel like. And it, and when we talk about L.A., I think we should kind of clarify what that means because <laughs> to a lot of people, it means different things. Right. People come here to the city in pursuit of the Hollywood dream. Right, right. And me and the homies talk about this all the time, just like L.A. versus Hollywood. Right, 100%. The Hollywood version of what L.A. is. Totally. And there's two different versions. Right, right. You know, and we see it in social <laughs> media, all these cats, like, talking shit about L.A., how fake it is. Like, they all don't, the time, right. They don't really know what's up with the real L.A. Nah, nah. You know what I'm saying? Well, nah. how would you describe, like, your version of L.A.? Man, 100%. Like, it's, it's so true because it's, like, it's Hollywood and and, and like, the rest of LA, right? And, and I feel like if you're from LA, you hear all these like tropes and all these like stereotypes about the city and you're like, that's not what I know, right? right? Like fake ass people or like, you know, like superficial folks. I'm like, you know, so, so for me, it's like, I grew up in Southeast LA in Huntington Park, right by Watts, right? And then we moved to Venice, right? And, and Venice, like when I was there, it was all black and brown folks. So I feel like our, our version of, of, of LA are like really like PLC heavy, you know, PLC oriented, like, immigrant folks mm -hmm. you know working class folks and i feel like a lot of people don't get those stories and like to your point earlier about like you know folks want the real la and, and yeah. i feel like folks like us like offer that perspective and that lens and like you know for a lot of people like our homies it's not new information right yep. like like the stories we tell it's like oh yeah you know like the p-line episode I just had or whatever like these are la stories but to the world it's like it's like wow that's la too 
you know so yeah it's, it's interesting man no nah, i feel you i mean i remember me growing up as a young asian kid and first time going like south to pico <laughs> yeah. you know what i'm saying and yeah. going to like an open mic in lamert park right and it was an eye opener for me because what I knew about the black community growing up at the time is like everything on the radio or television right. and gangster rap and right. all that. And I would meet these like young, like nerdy anime black mm -hmm. kids mm -hmm. from the hood, hood. Right, 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 right. And they that really changed my perception. Totally. And then even in high school, going skateboarding with like young Mexican punk rock kids. Totally, totally. And then knowing about all these little subcultures like the whole Morrissey fan base, right, 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 Latinos. Right, right, right. And, so you, you you start seeing these subcultures, and that's why I kind of wanted to jump into this next thing because you just wrote a book, mm -hmm. and this is something that cats, um, I mean, in LA have seen or heard about, but like now people are really recognizing mm -hmm. this, and it's, it's called the Compton Cowboys. Um, I'll put it right here just in case. Uh, sure, you can see you. that, right, Tony? Right there? Okay, the Compton Cowboys. Uh, talk about the Compton Cowboys a yeah, little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... so uh, the Compton Cowboys, like where I grew up, I grew up uh, uh, right, right off of Alameda Street, right? And like in Compton, like my mom would always, like we'd always go like shopping at the Compton Swap Meet like every weekend. And so like I, I remember being like six or seven years old and like driving down Alameda Street and like, I looked to my right and it, it's like these two black men on horses. And that shit was crazy because like, <laughs> you know, like that, that's a story like that none of us ever grow up learning about you right know? so it's like like black folks ride horses right and it's crazy because yeah, yeah. like my dad's black and, and, and my mom was mexican so i knew mexican folks rode horses right like, right like that's so normalized but like seeing seeing black men on horses like really fucked me up that's kind of crazy we wouldn't even like that we're just not used to that if you right. saw a black dude on a horse we're already like i was like wait what the yeah, fuck? Yeah, right yeah. like like just tripping and, and then and then like I, I never forgot that feeling and as a new york times writer I remember like I had just gotten back from like Ghana or somewhere working on a story and I was like, man, I'm homesick. I'm trying to be home for like a few weeks, you know, so like I better work on a story here. So, I, you know, I I thought about like them and, and I found them on, on, on Instagram and like the rest is history. Like I sent them a DM and, you know, it, it was just like a story that, you know, a lot of folks like know about the Compton Cowboys, don't know about them, but now everyone knows about them, you know. Give, give a little brief like mm -hmm. story on like what the origins of the Compton Cowboys yeah, and yeah. how that came out to be as like a collective of like uh, uh, um, you know young black people just riding horses for in sure, Compton. For sure, for sure, absolutely. So, so, so you know, like uh, the Compton Cowboys are essentially like the 2.0 version of like Compton's Cowboys, right? Like okay. there was like a whole first generation of black folks who came from like Louisiana and Texas and Oklahoma who arrived to LA like in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, right? They set up shop in Compton in this sort of like agriculture community called the Rich and Farms, which is like kind of wild if you think about it. Like, you know, most folks, when they hear about Compton, they think about what Easy right. e right? Mm -hmm. Like Dre, Gangster Rap, stuff like that. They don't imagine that there's like a thriving horse ranch right in the heart of Compton. So the Compton Cowboys kind of like come from that area. And like, it's essentially where like every horse ride in Compton begins and ends, right? And, and it's really dope because like, these are all like the second generation riders and who started riding in this um, youth club called the uh, Compton Junior Posse. And so, they kind of like officially banded together in 2017 and like they've been doing it man like they've been like you know trying to like both reinsert the black cowboy back into the history books but yeah. also like make writing cool again you know and yeah and they're really doing it it's interesting because this started this book project started with an article mm -hmm. you, you wrote right yeah was that for the new york times new york times article yeah and uh it, it was was it something that just kind of we wanted to further elaborate into a full book yeah. or were people the interest was the interest so you know 100 the light was on on this I mean, to, to be honest, like the light was on it, like the agents was on it, yeah. you know, everyone was on it, you yeah. know, and, and so I, I mean, like I said, I wasn't even thinking about book deals, none of that, right. like it, it kind of just like fell in my lap and I was like, okay, I'll write a book, you know, because, you know, it, it's like a dope experience to be able to like take like a 2000 words feature story and like turn that into like an 80,000 word project, yeah. right? And also like, you know, the film deal also came, became because of that and yeah, um, I just felt like it was like a, a dope way to like shed more light on, on their experience. Yeah, and did they appreciate that too? Oh, like, for sure, man. Like, like, yeah. like yeah, no, it, it was dope because like actually, what was rare about this book deal is that like it was like a collaboration agreement between right. me and the Cowboys. So like, most of the funds go back to the, to, to the ranch essentially. Right. You know, which is like really rare. Like in in, in most cases, author gets one hundred percent of 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 the deal, but in, in this case, they got a, a large percentage, and I was like. The ranch is, is is about to get that money, and that's dope. You know, I think a writer coming in 
you know, who comes from a similar background yeah, to kind yeah. of tell that story, mm-hmm. there's more of a trust there. Man, 100%, right? Because, like, uh, historically, it's been white folks, like, parachuting into these communities oh, of color. Yeah. Like, our communities around the world, essentially, right? right? So it's like, what's different about this story is that, like, I'm not some white dude from, like, Connecticut who, like, flew into L.A. to work on this story. Like, right. it literally took me five minutes to get to the ranch every single day. Yeah. And, like, we're all the same age. Like, we all grew up, you know, talking the same way, listening to the same music. And so most times, like... I had to remind myself that I was there working. Right. Because right. I was there chilling. Yeah. You know, just like chilling with my homies. And, and I think, like, hopefully that comes out in the book, like the love, the, the appreciation, and the honesty, you know? No, I feel that, man. I talk, That's something I talk about a lot about us really having to own our stories. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, like, take that, take charge of that before somebody comes in and does that. Because they'll do it. They will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, you already know because <laughs> right, right, you right. dropped the article and mad fools were Boom. like, this shit is hard. They was like, on it, bro. They, no, they, they, for sure. They, I couldn't do it. I, I've been to enough meetings right, to know right. if I hear the Compton Cowboys. You're like, oh, shoot, what's up? Like, I, right. wanna, I would want to jump on that right. as, like, a board dude at a studio or right. something of course you know, it's a, a gold mine it's, it's a gold mine man. for all these poc stories being told man. you know what i'm saying so you got to jump on that and and it's not even for the sake of like oh making money or it's it's really just i i get a good feeling out of knowing that damn we took ownership of this story we I told it's it it's our you know story bro. yeah you know that's amazing bro yeah. um as far as uh your upbringing mm-hmm. um you you actually majored in like uh uh what is it latino uh, studies or latin america studies, latin at, america studies? At stanford yeah i went to stanford for my master's um i i went to undergrad in portland and then after like my master's i was i was at ucla in a phd program in in, in chicano studies ethnic studies and like like i said man i was like heavy into like the academic right i thought that was for me you know yeah. like i had this idea of becoming a professor it seemed romantic you know what i'm saying like yeah but bro, like I just feel like a PhD program, like spending six, seven years in that, like wasn't for me. You were ready to kind of it was like a, a college ball player just like ready, <laughs> ready to, to go pro, ready right? Ready to go pro. No, like, but, that's but, the, but exactly in the field, you know, man, just, just, just ready, but also it, it's like we over here arguing about some like theoretical ass shit in class that I don't really care about. Yeah. Yeah. Where as like we could be out in the world working on stories that, that people actually read you know and, right and and and, and view so yeah it, and it then was, you jumped in and the things were kind of already moving you had you realized you had stories that were ready to be told yeah like it was a no-brainer i was like man i'd rather be out in the world telling stories than like you know the rest is history yeah man uh i just got put on to your uh, podcast word uh california love uh, it, and it, you know, you told me about this. It was r- just right about the drop when I met you. That week, yeah, yeah, that that week. And man, like I and you told me it was gonna be real LA and I listened to it. And I was <laughs> he like, he was like, I don't know, right? Nah, that shit was LA as fuck. And I, I even I even recognized the graph artist you mentioned, bro. Right, like Aloe and Sight. I would see them all the time. Up, my boys, I would man. see them up all the time 100%, in LA. Yep. And it's so weird when you when you talk about like graffiti artists, you know, on your podcast, yeah. like. A format you never would hear names like that mm-hmm, on. Mm-hmm, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. you, you, you're like, oh shit! Like I would see those names up, and yeah. there's a feeling of like you knowing them almost. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you yeah. see them every day, but never really think about like mm-hmm. who's behind it, kind of. Like listen, I don't know. Listen, and, and I feel like you know two things, right? Number one, that's how folks usually look at graffiti, right? Yeah. Like like folks see a, a message on a wall because it is a message, right? Like every form of graffiti on the wall is like a communication. It's telling a story, right? Like, you know, the wall is telling you, like, who's beefing? Yeah. Who just died? You know, it's, 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 it's talking, you know, it's, it's, it's like a story happening. So I see folks see that and, like, they just see the graffiti. They don't see, like, the art or the person, right? Yeah. And also, number two, with, 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 uh, with that story, it's like, you know, usually, like, stories about graph and graffiti are, like, told about these, like, famous artists, you know, t- told from some person who, like, never actually w- w- was in the world doing graffiti. And I think for me, it's like, I'm able to both be the, the, the participant and the observer, right? Yeah. Well, like, I'm talking about my experiences and experiences of Alan Sight, who are legends, you know? So, like, it, it, it's a special story, man. Yeah, it was dope. I mean, these this, so this podcast, California Love, is like these, like, uh, journalism pieces um, broken down into episodes, 30 minutes or so episodes. Um, you're two episodes in deep, and both, the first one is about your experiences as a young graffiti writer in Los Angeles and how it was almost short lived after an experience that <laughs> yeah. you've had. Yeah. And then you went into this different route and then you kind of reconnect with your old uh, yeah. writer friends. Mm-hmm. And then the second episode is about um, uh, the party line. <laughs> and for those who aren't familiar with the party line, why don't you go into that for a little sure. bit? Man, the, the, the party line was like like this like wild phone line. That, that we used to call it to every single night, right? Like me and my homies 
from like the ages of like 11 to 15 like we were on it consistently and like basically what it was was like you would call into this like free number and it was like 10 or 12 different rooms where like everything would go down yeah. right like like think about it, like all, all these teenagers people in their early 20s are calling the p-line to like hook up yeah to like flirt to like talk shit to like t uh, bang bang on each other like yeah. everything was happening and, and it's like the p-line is like where so many of us created these like alternate sort of identities for ourselves right so on the p line like my name was little brownie yeah, yeah right yeah. i was like 18 <laughs> years old i was like a mechanic in culver city right and like you know I, and like now i'm like why was i doing that like why was i creating th th this like uh, identity for me right but we were all doing that though because like i think it's actually kind of deep you know it, you know the p line was like pre-social media right like pre-instagram I, I, the thing is when you mentioned this i remember this but i wasn't heavily on it yeah i think i was on it like two three times <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. I never want like i guess the young AZN version of that yeah. was like AOL Instant Messenger or right. something like right, that. Right, 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 and right. And I would say it's that's kind of similar to the same way we were like this alter ego totally. and persona. ASL, right? Yeah, yeah, ASL, all that shit. <laughs> right, but right, right. Party Line was kind of more of a raw version of that. It was like a house party version of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, not 100%. It was yeah. a house party and it was like everything went down the P-Line, right? Like the P-Line is, is like where you first have phone sex with someone. The, That's the, wild. The, the, the P-Line yeah. is, is, is like where you like learn how to talk to folks like in like a sexual romantic way. Yeah. You know? and, a, and a lot of us like, you know, got better at talking to like girls or dudes like on the P-Line and it, it all That's went down. That's why I should have been, man. Yeah, I, I would have had more game. <laughs> the, the, my aim game was legit. It was but strong? Not the, not the, yeah, not like when I met them in person. Right, you're like, oh. <laughs> froze so. the fuck up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Low Brownie, that was that was your alias. That was and, my name, man. And like, you got on this pretty early, right? Yeah, I, I, I was like eleven years old, and I was like, "This Low Brownie." Like for some reason, I was like, "That was my name," you know. <laughs> no, that that episode was pretty deep, man. Mm -hmm. You had a uh, lot of time with a lot of people talking about their insecurities when they yeah. were young, mm -hmm. and you know, some dark experiences mm -hmm. from the P line, and like, and then the sound design was really dope on that, bro. Yeah. Like 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 you know, our team is is hella dope, man. Like you, you know, at the outset of the show, I was like, "Listen, like." Or of that episode, I was like, I want to recreate the P line, yeah. right? And and they were like, first of all, what's the P line, you know? And second of all, like, how do we do that? And I feel like my team was like so receptive and 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 and, and really kind of like you know like I'm I'm someone I, I come in with like wild ideas. I'm like, hey, let's do because I'm not like a podcaster per se, right? right, right. So, so I'm bringing in like, like a whole different energy, right? Where it's like kind of like you're not restrained by the rules I'm that not. might have set. Yeah, I'm I'm pushing the form, yeah, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm pushing the form, and sometimes they're like, bro, like chill, we can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and sometimes they're like yeah why not you, you know so it, it worked out and like our team is so great and, and i'm really thankful for them have you found this kind of new format this auditory element like really exciting and fun to play with yeah it's you know sound is so intimate man yeah like it's my first time like hosting like like an audio show like i've hosted documentaries and stuff but i've never only focused on audio and it's just like you speak into a mic you know and it's just so intimate so beautiful but also in terms of like letting people speak you know speak for themselves like you know i'm not pulling quotes from like an interview or something like that it's like you're literally allowing people to like tell their own story and yeah. like to me there's nothing more beautiful about that yeah and and then i i just noticed these layers you hear and the spacing of it all it just really makes it like more intimate and deep mm -hmm. i don't know yeah it just sets a really nice tone yeah no it, it's like super experiential you know yeah and, and, and it's like when you hear the show it, it's like environmental as well there's like it's super sound rich and it, it's really dope man the, this california love um show can we uh talk a little bit about what we can expect far as the upcoming episodes yeah um that focus specifically on on la For or sure. california yeah. totally man so the next episode uh that drops on thursday is about kobe right and and you know kobe to a lot of us like was a, a big figure in our lives, sure. you know, really complicated figure, you know, for obvious reasons. But I think like it goes without saying that Kobe meant so much to the city. So this next episode is about like my experience one time, like meeting Kobe and playing basketball with him, and then mm. like walking him to his car and, and oh, kind of hard. Oh, dude, dude, it's hard. It's hard. It, 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 when it, when it, did it, that happen? Man, it happened. In, so, so I used to hoop, man, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and it happened at UCLA. Like I was playing with all the pros, and like Kobe walks in, man, and just like fucks up my life, you know, because Kobe was like an idol. Yeah. And so we're like hooping and like I scored a basket on Kobe and fucked me up in a really great way. And like <laughs> later that day, like the person who, who, who I pulled up to the uh, the gym with, um, Coach Hazard, he was then the, the Lakers assistant coach. So like Kobe asked him to walk into his car and I was a Coach Hazard. So like wherever, wherever he was going, I was going. So I go to his car and I'm, I'm, I'm walking by Kobe and like the hut, like I don't want to spoil the episode, but, but it's just beautiful. But it also talks about like what Kobe meant to the city, you know, right. to LA and it's really dope, man. So, so we got that. Uh, 
after that um i like wrote this short story about the la green parrots right yeah you're telling me about yeah this. This and, is and an experimental one ex- right? experimental as fuck yeah, and, yeah. And, and i'm basically like one of the parrots and like i take us through because like all the green parrots in la that we see out in the wild they're all from like northeast mexico they were okay. all brought here in cages and shit so like I go deep and I'm like one of these parrots and like I, I walk us through the whole thing about getting to That's LA dope. and, and kind of like social commentary on like our current immigration system mm. about how broken it is, you yeah. know, how we got children in cages, you know, at the border and stuff like that. that that's the interesting thing. I mean, just talking about that alone, you know, I was uh, born in Argentina mm-hmm. and my mom, you know, s- snuck me and my younger sister in when I was three and she was one. Wow. As like this Korean woman with the coyotes and like she was like really? the only like Korean woman during this process. Wow. And I, I, I keep thinking about that story and how like interesting that is, you know. Yeah. So I feel very connected to this like immigration mm-hmm. uh, 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 the problem that's going on right now mm-hmm. with ICE and all this mm-hmm. shit. Mm-hmm. It's like, damn, that could have went down at any given time. One hundred percent. Then you know, right. and and uh, it's 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 fucked up because like the problems is not getting resolved. There's kids still in cages right now. And like you know, off, I mean, I don't even want to go into the presidential. No, shit, no, no, one hundred percent. It's just a fucking nightmare. It's a fucking nightmare, right? Yeah, it's a fucking nightmare. But we live. We're so close to that experience being from LA. Mm-hmm, I feel like mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And I feel like if you grew up in LA, you also realize that like it's not just Mexican folks at the border, right? Yeah. Who, who, who experience problems with our broken immigration system. It's like Central American folks, Asian folks, West African folks, like all types of folks, you, you know, who, who in some way like struggled to find like peace and, 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 and hope in, in LA. Yeah. And so this whole parrot episode is kind of like a testament to that about how like, you know, this whole idea about, about immigrant folks, you know, being framed as like invasive, you know, like, yeah. like taking away resources and like, the green parrots also are called invasive sometimes, but they're actually making LA better, you know? So, right. th- so yeah, man, I, I mean, I, I feel like that idea about immigration is like so tied to LA, c- cause like, you know. And I don't understand when cats who are from here treat, uh, you know, Latino Americans like l- l- uh, outsiders almost. It's crazy, Cause bro. you should have been grown up with that here it's already. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, and I see like, footage of huntington beach or these areas like hella mag hella maga cats you know wilding and protesting it's wild and it's just weird like that shit could go on yeah you in know? a place like southern california yeah because right? it feels like this is this is like like their land really yeah <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah, and, but, and, and and also i feel like you know la and california right like folks like hail it as like super progressive or, or like you know radical but but it's some racist ass folks out here you oh, know 100%. Like, like this is a yeah. racist city in, 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 in so many different ways and also racist states sometimes no we don't re- we don't realize that there was protests even in san diego mm-hmm. like super right-wing conservative yeah, cats man. i remember it was one time me and the homegirl went out to san diego and the homegirl was wearing this like one of them parody make america great again hats but it was about <laughs> weed like like make weed you know which i hate fucking hate those goddamn par- even the parody the parody joints, shit yeah because it's still confusing as fuck like, like, oh, okay, okay. yeah like what are you really trying to say <laughs> right, right, right 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 <laughs> like, but she was wearing some of the like make cannabis great again or some <laughs> shit but like <laughs> these two white dudes passing by he doesn't know it's a parody he's like Hell yeah. Oh, he was rocking with it. <laughs> yeah, he was like, oh, he didn't see the cannabis part or nothing. He was just like, he's just thinking it's a, you know, MAGA hat. Oh my God. That's hilarious, right? Wow. And he's just like, <laughs> and we're just like, oh, uh, yeah, we were confused at the time, but that's what we realized <laughs> yeah. went down right there. Right. And that's that was crazy. hilarious, man. That's um, so crazy. Man. I mean, but yeah, man, well, listening to the podcast, I was super stoked to just hear such nostalgic moments like even uh you know me growing up in los angeles of course dabbled in tagging mm-hmm. and writing and we all shit. did we all did yeah i was so trash <laughs> <laughs> went through a variety of names right never, like, and you know i went to belmont high school that's so right belmont yards right there absolutely man uh, that like, shit was so sick to to see and shit yeah we, 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 th- we used to always um like from the west side we used to take this uh this like blue bus called the uh, 10 and the 10 bus would like pick you up on, on Bundy and Pico and go on the 10 freeway and drop you off, like, you know, right up the street from uh, Belmont and, and, and drop you off there. And, and, and like, we'd like walk down to the Belmont yards and just be there for hours, man. Yeah. L- like, you know, we, we always got hit up by, by like Temple Street Gang or somebody, right. you, you know, like always right. messing with us and we, we're always there. Yeah, man, I that's that was me like just walking by getting banged on getting banged by like <laughs> Rockwood or that's like right. Temple. Yeah, 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 like yeah all the time, man, all the time. Yeah, I, re- <laughs> I had a funny story getting banged, like, Coming home from walking from the school bus to the crib, um, like right on the edge of K Town, historic Filipino mm-hmm. town, and these 
three like cholos like they were fully like in work clothes i think from like <laughs> some kind of electronic store because right. they were like in ele- like full work clothes they pulled up on me it was like i like your chain homie pick off your You're chain like, bro, <laughs> i'm like no i'm good <laughs> it's like I don't. and then let me try on your chain and take my chain and just walked off and they were literally on just like lunch break a bro. lunch break no man, man. Was- <laughs> a similar story but i got banged on one time uh, on the west side off of venice boulevard by these by these three cholo homies yeah. who 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 worked at a at an animal hospital yeah yeah. so yeah. they were on their lunch break walking these these like That's poodles wild. and banged on i'm <laughs> like bro what like you, you walk in the like, poodles like the, with the blue scrubs and everything i'm like damn let me just squeeze it doesn't one stop in. Right, let me let me squeeze one in real quick <laughs> come up real quick i'm like bro it, it's, it's like 12 o'clock like chill oh man chill lunch break. Wild. Um, let me ask you this, because, I mean, just talking about the Belmont Yards, especially how, you know, uh, when they built, like, a parking lot or, you know, right. high rise around right. there. Right. Makes me think about the changes in L.A. and what you think about the changes mm-hmm. in L.A. Like, how do you feel like L.A. has changed since this L.A. that you're painting right now man. in your California Love Podcast? Yeah, man, man, so much. You know, to be honest, I feel like making this show was, like, you know, it, it was really beautiful, but it, it, was, it was a lot of pain, right? And a lot of sadness that had to be excavated, you know? I feel like... So many of my friends have gotten like pushed out of, of LA. You know, the the restaurants I used to go to, like the spots, like a lot of them closed down. And, and so I feel like for a lot of us, man, like we're like leaning heavily into nostalgia because like the future seems mm. like, you know, unstable yeah, for us. Like, I agree. Nostalgia we, is big right now. It's big yeah. right now because like in, in so many ways, like that's all we got. Right. You know, and, and that keeps us afloat because like it's, it's also really sad too because like it, it's, it's so many more white folks here, you know, who like had no idea that this community existed here or, or that experience ex- existed there. So, man, it's, you know, LA's changed so much, but I think demographically, you know, like folks of color have, have been continued to be pushed out of LA, you know? And, you know, in, in terms of like, like LA, like booming in terms of like creative industries now, like a lot of folks are moving to LA to like be creative and do creative shit. And I feel like people in our communities are the ones who, who are suffering because of that, you know? Yeah, it's it sucks because this LA that you're, the history of LA that you talk about, it, it feels like it can get lost so easily because yeah. mm-hmm. it's like you don't see that much documentation on it no, and it's don't. like once newer shit comes in and takes over it's like la just becomes almost like a silicon valley of like totally. culture almost totally you totally. know what i'm no, saying yeah, yeah. Of, of creative shit there's totally. creative shit but there's no history behind it right. we don't have a history of la almost right right you know and then you know just talking about just you know we were talking about born and raised right. and stuff they try to salvage that as well yeah. you know yeah. um and it's 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 really sad, man. I see it in, happening in Koreatown too. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've always tried to represent the best parts of Koreatown, mm-hmm. the culture, the food, and all that, but also show that there's a history behind that That's right. and, and uh, the locals. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and and I love the idea of integrating. Uh, you know, newcomers and all that, but we can do it for we sure. Can, we can do it, but we definitely it. there's a the, there's a part that cat shit like respect you know right of like the cats totally. who've been here totally man totally and, and 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 i feel like it's on us to like to like tell those stories and like maybe like talk about those boundaries man because like if we don't do it who else you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Is, is that i mean um when you were kind of working on this california love podcast was it pretty easy to just think of like what you wanted to talk about i mean how, how did that come about or was there or was it things like oh shit like i kind of low-key <laughs> forgot about this yeah. you know what i mean like yeah yeah no um it definitely took like some thinking, like some episodes, like the like scare straight, like, like the first episode for me. Like, I was like, I've always wanted to, to tell this story, you know. I, I think it's a powerful story, and like that was only like half the story, right? Like the other half we couldn't really tell because it's really long. But like that story was easy. The P line, you know, I, I haven't thought about the P line in a long time. That's what I'm saying. That one was crazy because when yeah. you brought that up, like. All of a sudden, I remembered like, oh, it, but shit, I hadn't P- thought about right. that even like once in like ten years, right, bro. Right? Yeah. No. No. I, I feel like it was a, it was a conversation I had with like a friend of mine like, like a year ago, like talking about the P line. I was like, that'd be a cool episode to 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 do. But but the rest, like you know, like there's like an episode about Kobe, right? Which is like timely because Kobe just passed. There's an episode about the Green Parrots, which like I've always like been fascinated by. There's an episode about my mom. There's like a episode about like the Compton Cowboys. So like you know, um, it it, it was like kind of either or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think about that and, 
you know, you kind of inspire me with some of these episodes because it makes me think about the nostalgic moments that were so interesting, even in the Asian community. Right, um, right, right. Like when the, when there was this AZN culture, this was like rice rockets and right, right. You know, K Swisses and long <laughs> tees, and it, a that, lot of yeah. it was actually very influenced by the Latino community. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It was yeah. like you look at these Asian kids and they look like cholos and shit. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. So uh, you know, with it, the internet culture, with AIM and everything too, right. like that was all part part of it but it's like we don't know how that even formed you know so it's like it makes me want to like talk about like how that came about it's hella fascinating man yeah you know it's so interesting i I feel like in terms of like you know there are like racial tensions in la right like off top like we got to recognize that like you know i've seen it i've experienced it you know it's wild but i also feel like like real la people you know we also grew up with like hella like you know like Hella Asian homies, Latino homies, right. hella black homies. You know, like for real. You the know, influence crosses over. The like, influence crosses. It's crazy. Clearly, you know, it's, 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 like, like we all fuck with each other. We all yeah. love each other. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like real, real LA folks, like we recognize that, like how we grew up was like really special. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, it just got me thinking. Um, because there was all this like graphic, and uh, there was like these online graphics that were spreading. That was this AZN love type stuff, and it was almost similar to Teen Angel mm. in the Latino community mm-hmm. with like the prison art and lowriders yeah, 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 and all course, that being drawn in and shit. Of course, and I was like, damn, there's a huge similarity there. It's huge, man. Yeah, man. What what's uh what's next for you, bro? I mean, you got this podcast that's gonna yeah. be episodic. Every Thursday it drops yeah. on Spotify and that, like pretty much all streaming Apple, platforms. Apple, Spotify, Google Play, wherever. It's called California love but mm-hmm. um what's uh how, how many episodes of that it's it, it's eight episodes so, so we got okay. about like six left or so six, about six. five or six and yeah. did you already like record all of them and stuff y- yeah so so recorded all of them you know we, you know we, we got really lucky because like we stopped field recording right before the uh, pandemic hit you know so we got Damn. really yeah. lucky man but, but i've been like in the studio doing like final tracking and vocals um what's next man like you know i'm actually like transitioning out of journalism and, and like into tv and film stuff you know like nice. I'm, I'm i'm writing now i'm i'm, I'm directing like a, a short right now and i feel like that's the next evolution you know for, off for, the checklist of all the mediums yeah no like, <laughs> but, but for real man like journalism the, pieces no yeah i feel like for a lot of us creative folks like it, it's not about the medium you know it's about, I feel that. It, it's about the story yeah right like so, certain stories require more sound heavy like some right. more visual sometimes we gotta write a book right but whatever it is like if you understand story and narrative, you know, that's all that really matters. And, right. and, and a lot of us do. No, real talk. I, we, I, we talked about this the other day yeah. where I want to venture off into a uh, podcast because I've been doing a lot of TV writing and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, and, yeah. and I was even want to explore writing a book, too. But it's, it's intimidating for any cat out yeah. there, for <laughs> sure. Coming from no background, mm-hmm. college or nothing, mm-hmm. it could be intimidating to be like, I'm gonna write a book. Right. But you made it seem like very comforting, like I can do it. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it, you, you know, it's it's possible, man. I feel like, like, the structure of writing, right, kind of fucks with us, right? Because a lot of us were like, you know, grew up like reading the classics or whatever, and like that's not how we speak. That's not like r- really how we how we see the world. But I feel like today there's like more of a market and, and more appreciation for like honest and real and raw voices. Yeah. Right. And I feel like, you know, this book, like I'm not writing like some old white dude, like I'm writing how I speak in, 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 in most situations. I mean, even the podcast, even to the be podcast, honest, that bro. was actually comforting because, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I actually listened to it because I was curious, but also almost as a point of reference for me to explore this podcast, uh, like a uh, scripted podcast thing. Absolutely, man. And when I heard it, I was like, yo, like he's talking just kind of just telling a straightforward like we're hanging out hanging out telling a straightforward story um very easy to understand where the story's going and having a lot of it even just being narrated by the 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 friends and family you have on it or whatever yeah and it was the best it was so it was so comforting to know like damn like i think i can tell my stories and <laughs> absolutely way too. good 100 percent. and i feel like you know a lot of us like we're already great storytellers because like we come from like families and traditions of storytellers right because you know i learned how to tell stories by listening to my aunts and my uncles tell these like you know crazy ass like dramatic stories about life and about ghost stories or whatever right yeah. and i think like you know we want to hear ourselves right like I made this show for like my friends and my family essentially right like and i feel like the difference today is folks of color historically right you know we've had to like have white folks a- as a reference as the audience true you know true. and 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 folks have been like well if white people won't understand then it won't be successful right you know like it's, it's not gonna hit but i feel like now there's been a change where it's like we're actually making stuff for our family and friends 
and white folks fuck with that even more right, right. like there's less explaining in our stories you know right. like the onus is on them to like do their research you know yeah. not, not us like we're done like explaining shit like right, we're right, exhausted. right we really are yeah no you know what i actually appreciate man is that we have homies in our communities that aren't able to get their voice heard yeah a lot of times yeah. you know i got i got these like wild ass homies <laughs> Same, you know right, right. and who have like crazy stories and, right. and coming from crazier background even than me yeah, yeah, yeah. but i know like oh i have this platform or right. like a gift of yes. storytelling mm -hmm. and i can take that and really share it because i feel like a lot of times i have that duty too because mm -hmm. i feel bad when like outsiders come in and uh even the homies could get very defensive in a For way sure where they can push that push them away for sure and they all of a sudden get um you know outshined and like ignored right the voices get ignored right and i feel like there needs to be these bridges mm -hmm. of people who can go into a board meeting with 12 white dudes and kill the story right for right. Them. right 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 you know right, what right. i'm no, saying no i i hear you man and i feel like that's our responsibility right that you know and it's not a burden you know, like, like in no way I think is that a burden. I think it's like, it's, it's not even pressure. It's just like, you know what? Like I've been put in this situation for a reason, right? right? Like whether it's God, whether it's the universe, whatever it is, right? I'm here. What do I do with this platform? What do I do with this responsibility? Like, like you know, the, 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 the goal is to always bring the hood to the table. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and I feel like we're at the table, but we're also inviting the homies too, so, so to speak. No, I, I think you do that in your podcast. You bring a lot of the, you reconnect with some homies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, those conversations are pretty deep, man. <laughs> they're so deep, man. They are, they're so deep. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, man. Was I, that shit therapeutic, actually? this Dude, like I'm, you know, like I've been in therapy for like the past two years, right? Yeah, yeah. And I feel like this show and this podcast, like just let me know that like there's still a lot of work to be done, mm -hmm. right? P because, you know, a, a lot of us like, We've been through some traumatic ass shit. That's what I was just about to say. Trauma, like Trump, past trauma. Bro. There's, there's, a lot of the the guests you bring on, like share those traumas. Share those traumas, and, and and you know, for a lot of us, like I feel like as POCs, as, as folks of color, like we do a great job of like compartmentalizing shit. You know, like put, putting shit in the back of our minds, like forgetting about it, like putting it under the rug, because like that's how we survive, right? But but for me in this show, it's like damn, it's like okay, like the teenage trauma, the childhood stuff, like it all has surfaced for me. And sometimes it's hard, you know, to, to talk about that. But but I know that, like, if I talk about it, if I'm vulnerable, then hopefully other other folks will be, too. Yeah. I mean, the first two episodes that you have out are about people finding different outlets for those traumas. Yeah. yeah. Whether it's the P-line or tagging. Like. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting, right, because I feel like, you know, our communities, right, like, we don't have the access to, like, mental health services, right, to, to like, insurance often. So... We even have to find, like, not just creative ways to survive, but creative ways to, like, cope with, like, mental health stuff. So, so what do we do? We, like, paint walls. Like, that's art. That's right. therapy. We, like, go on the P-line, you know, to, like, find a space to, like, let things go. And that's what we do, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, that's essentially what hip-hop was, mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. You know? Exactly. I mean, and, and all these little subcultures that I got involved in, whether it's skateboarding and yeah. all that. And, and L.A. has a lot of that. <laughs> it's all that, man. For yeah, sure. L.A. is a lot of that. Um... So you're talking about going to different mediums, like that means television, mm -hmm. uh, film, and that could mean stuff with some of the stories you're telling in your yeah. podcast yeah, to yeah. see on the screen. Absolutely. You're excited, like excited to take that to the visual <laughs> aspect of it? Yeah, man. Like, you know, I'm, I've always been interested in like evolution of stories, right? And and to me, like the, the podcast, like, you know, it has so many elements that w like already scream like television, you know, and, and mm -hmm. our cinematic and our visual. And for me, like, it's just like, you know, being in a position where like, I'm also at the helm of those conversations, right? Where like, I'm not just selling a show and, and just like, you know, not being involved, but I'm actually writing now, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm producing it because like, you know, who knows these stories better than us, right? So I'm, I'm excited about that evolution. Um, I think that's what I'm, I'm really focused on. Do right you now. feel like a lot of the, um, the media in the past couple of years has been a drastic change as far as, you know, the stories being told? I think so, man. I think like, y y you know, for a lot of us, like y young, younger folks of color, like we, you know, are finding that like our stories, like, you know, are really, I mean, we've known they've been important and beautiful, but it's like now there's like more space for them and more platforms for them, you know, and w whether it's like a show like Atlanta or like Rami yeah. or whatever, like, you know, these shows just, just let us know that like, our stories can, can can be on the screen. Like if if you had just a log line of what kind of stories you're trying to tell, like what would it be? Yeah, man, you know, like I really tell stories, like of course about the human experience, right? But yeah. like 
I tell stories about belonging, man, about what it means to belong to something, mm. right? Because, like, that's something in my personal life that I've always struggled with, you know, like, black, brown, what am I sort of thing, you know? And, and so for me, it's like, I'm trying to find those answers in, in, in the questions I ask people. Yeah, you know, so like it, it's kind of this like therapeutic thing that that I'm actually doing. Like I'm I'm working, I'm I'm like documenting, I'm, I'm working on stories, but I'm actually like trying to heal myself, right? Essentially, so so it's like it's always about belonging. It's always about like community and, and identity, mostly. You know, that's a good thing you brought up about you um, th- with these identity crises. Like you know, I had that growing up as well. But you being black and Latino, yeah. like that's an interesting mix for Los Angeles. Man, if you think about it, because I actually have another homie too, who's okay. half and half like that. Okay. And uh, we don't talk about that because there's there's a lot of friction too between two communities That's in right. Los Angeles That's too right. That's right. that a lot of people may not know or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know this that the friction really doesn't exist much in the East Coast like right. in New York. Right, totally. It, but it's something that's very LA. Mm-hmm. Like, what was that experience like for you? Man, it was it, it was tough, right? Because because on one hand you got like the media telling you that like black and brown folks hate each other yeah like gang wars gang wars yeah. r- you know race riots which i experienced in schools like there were race riots yeah i'm like fuck what do i do yeah yeah you know, I'm, I'm like shit, shit i'm gonna just stay home today fuck right, it, you know? right 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 like, you know i love you i love you i'm not gonna fight nobody so so it's like it, it's complicated man but also you know in our, the the anti-black racism that exists in our families too is deep like on my mexican Interesting. side you, okay. you, you know a lot of love from like from from, from you know mexican family but also you, you always got like some relatives who are on the anti-black shit you know so it's like as a child trying to like grow up and like have this healthy identi- uh, idea of who you are like it hurts to have people in your family you know feel feel like a type of way about you um but like LA also is, is hella black and brown, you know? Like a, a It lot is. Of, that's it, that's what's confusing. It's confusing, yeah. You're in Los Angeles and uh we know it's it's diverse but it can be very segregated For sure. too. Um For sure. but I I know when I was growing up, I'm uh there was a lot of all this media stuff between black and brown communities, right. um gang wars that right. were always talked about right. and, and of course it was it wasn't I will admit it wasn't like east coast or something like the puerto rican dominican right uh community com- with with the black community right you know and i was just like curious like how when you were in the midst of it all <laughs> man it was a trip man like it like i'm i'm still trying to ask myself that question about like like how to exist in a world where i can be both at the same time um but you know it's, it's a question i think I'll, I'll struggle for a long time yeah i mean you uh, you have it in your name right there walter <laughs> yeah. thompson hernandez it's deep, man <laughs> like the, the longest name i got like all the letters in the alphabet, man, right there. No, I think it's dope, though, because you really see the half black oh, for and sure. brown right there. <laughs> Walter right there. Thompson Hernandez. Off top, man, for sure, 100%. <laughs> Yo, I'm stoked for the projects that's coming out, bro. And, I, you know, I really wanted to follow up with you just because after we chatted, just after that dinner, I really connected, man. 100%, man. Like, it, was, it was mutual. I, I, I want to do something with y- this yeah, dude right here. Yeah, you know, no, 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 you know I... I feel like we have been homies for a long time, man. Yeah, for real. You know? That's what it felt like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yo, uh, where can yeah, cats can find this book on everywhere. Amazon? Everywhere. You're doing a book tour right now. Virtual book tour. Oh, vir- yeah, <laughs> virtual book tour. It's, it's a whole different vibes right now Dude. with press junkets for you know artists or creatives putting stuff out right now. It's definitely different. How's that been? It's a trip. I don't love it. Um, like I'm, I'm staring at screens all day right. long. Like all the zoom backgrounds you know it, it's but it is what it is bro like yeah it, it could be worse you know like we're, like we're still very privileged to be able to like have things out in the world that we got a hundred percent like like you know talk about so i i, I feel lucky man how, did, how does that like how does feeling dropping a book feel and i know how it feels like to drop an album <laughs> right 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 it's like a book just i feel like it, it would hit different it, it, <laughs> it man it hits different because it's, it's an actual like tangible physical thing right right, right. Like, like I can walk around with this book and be like, yo, I wrote this shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, it feels good, man. I feel like, like I still can't believe it. Like you holding that book is wild to me. Like I, I wrote that book, you know. But it, it feels cool. Like you get to a certain age. Like this has happened to me in the last couple of years, where you got homies who do amazing things, but now you got homies who drop books. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I got like like five, six homies who got books out I, right I, now. I got books in the world. Yeah, it, it, that feels dumb to have a core group of homies yeah. who've done that. And, and, and you know, like for, for like a lot of folks in my family, like now it makes sense, right? Cause, Cause you know, a, a, a lot of our relatives don't know what we do. Yeah. Right, they're like, what do you do? You like tell stories, what do you do? Mm. But like they could hold a book and be like, oh, you wrote this book. Okay, I get it now, yeah. right? So it, it, it makes sense for them. That's how you're gonna you're gonna pull up with the Spanish translator. Right, <laughs> it's game over right <laughs> game there, over bro. Right there. Game. You could cop, you could cop the book Amazon and, and Barnes and Nobles, all that stuff on on websites everywhere. Um, also the podcast, which I highly recommend, especially if you're an LA cat. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but it's, it's fun for everybody if you don't even know don't know about those worlds it'll really paint that picture for you mm -hmm. um it's called california love a uh, walter thompson hernandez you could type either one right to find it for sure yeah you totally. can find it. um yo thanks for pulling on man appreciate you man i Thank appreciate you, you bro super dope all right tune in next week for another episode of fun with dumb peace Yee.